terms of the transduction method, we can separate biosensors according to thermal, mechanical, electrochemical, or optical biosensors. Thermal sensors are those that change the temperature upon a biorecognition event. Uh, typically, they are considered to be only feasible for enzyme catalyzed reactions where sufficient heat is generated, which is fairly rare. And for that reason, these are considered typically to be low sensitivity and to require high concentration of analyte to give a measurable signal. I put an asterisk here because there have been some reports of uh, photothermal sensors, and that's actually something that my group is looking into developing at the moment, where we can incorporate photothermal nanoparticles as a transducing agent to be able to amplify the signal uh, by generating heat, which would be uh, which would be proportional to amount of the analyte that is being detected. Uh, so I'll just leave that there as a train of thought. Uh, the second type of uh, transduction methods are going to be mechanical, where the re recognition leads to a change in the overall mass of the sensing element. And that change in mass is going to affect some of the properties of the sensing element. For example, we can have a piezoelectric detection, including quartz crystal microbalances, which, they, which are figured right here. So in a quartz crystal microbalance, what you have is a crystal, a quartz crystal substrate that is modified with a thin gold layer, which enables it to be electrically uh, connected to a circuit. Through that circuit, a voltage is applied that uh, originates a, a vibration on the quartz crystal. And that vibration is going to be changed upon addition of mass onto the crystal. So the more mass that is deposited onto the crystal, the lower that frequency is going to be, that frequency of vibration. So we can easily detect changes or binding events by looking at the changes in the frequency of the crystal vibration. And we, in my lab, we have actually utilized that to uh, be able to look at the degradation kinetics for uh, very small DNA-enabled hydrogels, which is what's shown on the right-hand side, uh, where basically we took a DNA cross-linked hydrogel and we uh, exposed it to an enzyme that would degrade the hydrogel. And as you can see, there's a frequency increase as the hydrogel degrades, because as it degrades, it would basically come off the surface uh, and we can readily detect that. On the other hand, we could also detect whenever um, we had a controlled hydrogel that was not degradable, but whenever we added the enzyme, the DNA's enzyme, uh, that was supposed to degrade the hydrogel, what we could see would be a lower uh, or lowering in the frequency response because of the fact that some of that enzyme was actually being deposited onto all of the surface and thereby decreasing the frequency. So that's obscured on this side because you have so much degradation that it is completely um, uh, overwhelming the opposite effect of the enzyme adhering to the surface. This is a very sensitive technique. It is a little bit uh, difficult to conduct accurately. It's kind of problematic, uh, but it is very, uh, very powerful technique. Another technique that has been utilized for this mechanical sensing is the micro cantilever uh, system. Uh, which is as shown, and we have discussed it before. But basically what you have is a micro cantilever, which is a thin platform uh, that, is, uh, that is kind of free to vibrate, free to move, and it is modified with whatever biorecognition molecules you are interested in. For example, in this case, it was uh, functionalized with a self-assembled monolayer uh, to which they attached an antibody. And then that antibody has affinity for certain biomolecules that are of interest. And the, um, the changes in the bending of that micro cantilever as a function of target uh, biorecognition can be measured in a number of ways. In this particular case, we're talking about mechanical changes, so mechani uh, changes in the frequency of vibration of this uh, micro cantilever platform, but it could also be interrogated by looking at optically, but through the interrogation with a laser uh, light, where basically changes in the angle of bending of that micro cantilever can be easily seen as changes in the angle of uh, laser uh, reflection. Uh, similarly, it can also be detected electrically uh, through, um, what do you call it, by utilizing uh, MOSFET systems, uh, but I'm not going to get into that part now. Uh, 
And in this case, as I showed, it was basically functionalized by utilizing a biological recognition molecule, but we could also functionalize that microcantilever with a synthetic mimic, in this particular case, a three-dimensional polymer network that could be swollen upon uh, interaction with the analyte of interest. And that swelling would, of course, change the angle uh, of that cantilever and, and change the vibration of it, etc. The third type of sensors are electrochemical sensors. These electrochemical sen sensors typically are going to be looking at ion transport, ion distribution, and electron transfer reactions that occur at the interface between a solution, which has the physiological molecules of interest, and a solid conductor, which is typically known as an electrode. Uh, the electrochemical detection can be divided into at least three categories, uh, and parametric detection is that in which we're going to be looking at changes in current uh, between a working and reference electrodes. Uh, an example of an amperometric uh, sensor would be maybe a, a glucose sensor in which uh, the, liver or the use or the liberation of electrons in, a, in the reaction can be detected by changes in the current. The fourth type of transduction method is going to be optical transduction, which can be divided into colorimetric, fluorescence, uh, luminescence, and other types. To begin with colorimetric transduction, what we're doing is basically measuring and changes in absorption, transmission, or light scattering intensities. Uh, this can be detected either visually or through the use of instrumentation such as an absorption spectrometer or a microscope or an optical system similarly to those. That is basically going to have a light source and a detector, photodetector. Uh, in terms of colorimetric, uh, one of the main systems that are utilized are those that utilize enzymes, for example, in this case, horseradish peroxidase. The enzyme is going to enable the conversion of a precursor compound into a colorful compound. In this particular case, we're looking at the use of tetramethylbenzidine, which in the presence of hydrogen peroxide and the enzyme horseradish peroxidase, turns into a blue compound on, upon its oxidation, and which also liberates additional uh, hydrogen peroxide. But in this case, we're looking at colorimetric detection. So basically, we're looking at the development of this blue compound. I should mention that typically in this reaction, um, the there's going to be a, another step, which is called a stopping step or stopping of the reaction, in which sulfuric acid is added. And upon additional sulfuric acid, this blue solution actually turns yellow, which is what is showing here. The initial blue turns into a yellow, and uh, at that point we can read the, uh, the, the amount of that yellow compound and compare it to a standard curve of known concentrations of the initial uh, compound. Uh, now, when would we utilize this horseradish peroxidase? We would utilize the horseradish peroxidase, or HRP, to enable the detection of another analyte. For example, if we are interested in this target protein, which is symbolized by, by this triangle, we might use a primary antibody that is specific to that protein, and then we would use a secondary antibody that is labeled with the enzyme, with the horseradish peroxidase. Uh, we're not interested in really measuring the horseradish peroxidase. We want to know the concentration of this guy, but the amount of horseradish peroxidase is going to be proportional to amount of that target protein in the sample. We then add our substrate, which in this case would be the tetramethylbenzidine, and upon the reaction, we're going to get the formation of that colorful product, and the color level is going to be then proportional to the amount of the target enzyme of interest. Other um, other substrates that can be oops, sorry about that. Other substrates that can be utilized in addition to TMB are uh, diaminobenzene. Diaminobenzene is a compound that actually forms a precipitate upon interaction with HRP. And this is actually the one that is utilized for histology and pathology, and which we saw in the paper that was presented by Ashley last week. Um, another enzyme that has been used in this kind of colorimetric sensors is uh, alkaline phosphatase, which similarly enables the um, oxidation of substrates into, uh, into color um, chromophores, I should say. The next type of optical transduction is going to be fluorescence. 
inflorescence what we're going to have is a small molecule organic fluorophore or a quantum dot that is utilized to provide a signal and so in this slide i wanted to kind of introduce fluorescence in fluorescence you're going to have a molecule that is going to absorb a particular wavelength of light in that abs in in undergoing that absorption that molecule is going to have electrons that are going to be taken from the ground state to a high energy vibrational state that electron is then going to lose some energy through thermal uh, losses and go down to the lowest singlet excited state. From there, it will um, go down to the ground state by emission of that, the remaining energy uh, in the form of a photon, which is going to be your fluorescence. Now, because the difference in energy from the energy that was absorbed to the energy that is emitted, you can see that they're different because of the thermal losses, your fluorescence emission is going to be of lower energy and therefore longer wavelength, which is what results in the Stokes shift. And you can see that on the right-hand side. Here we're seeing the absorption spectrum for a particular fluorophore. You can see that the absorption peak is at a lower wavelength than the emission peak, which is the red one here on, on the right-hand side. Uh, and that Stokes shift is the change in the wavelength of the peak uh, for that particular molecule. So our fluorescence will always be of longer wavelength and lower energy than the absorbed light. And another thing to remember is that for fluorescence, you always need an excitation light. If there's no excitation, there will not be any light emission. And that is different from luminescence, which we will cover in a few slides. Now, not all molecules are able to fluoresce. Uh, in fact, you actually need a molecule that has a conjugated resonance system. Uh, so basically conjugated double bonds as shown here. This particular molecule is fluorescein, which is the most widely utilized uh, fluorophore out there. And then on the right hand side, I have the particular molecule Alexa Fluor 555, which is being shown here for the uh, absorption and emission wavelengths. Um, Sometimes uh, I, I also wanted you to be, become familiar with the term excitation. We would utilize excitation for the light that we use to enable these this, this, this electrons to go up to the excited state. So basically the light that the molecule can absorb is the excitation light. And then your emission is going to be your fluorescence, whatever light, is, whatever energy is coming out of that fluorophore, out of that molecule. Um, I also wanted to mention that there's hundreds of fluorescent dyes, uh, organic dyes that are in the market or that can be synthesized. Some of the well-known names are Alexa Fluors, Dialytes, Bodipi, and Cyanine Dyes. And all of these dyes have some benefits and, and drawbacks. One of the main drawbacks of all of the organic fluorophores is that they tend to photobleach. Uh, basically, if they are irradiated with light for too long, uh, their fluorescence is going to diminish, diminish or stop. And so in that case, uh, quantification might be inaccurate because you might be thinking that there is less uh, of the analyte than there really is if your fluorophore is no longer fluorescing appropriately. Also, the fluorescence of some of these dyes can be affected by conditions such as pH or temperature. So that's something that needs to be um, you know, taken into account when developing a biosensor. Uh, some of them, on the other hand, can be stable at uh, different pH levels or different temperatures. So it just depends. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention in terms of fluorescence is that I highly recommend you guys go to this website. Uh, which is called Fluorescent Spectra Viewer. It used to be, uh, or it used to be provided by the company Molecular Probes, which was later purchased by Invitrogen and then later purchased by Thermo Fisher. Uh, but basically this website enables you to select a range of different fluorophores. They have hundreds listed there. And it enables you to see the excitation and the emission peaks for each of those fluorophores. In this case, I have DAPI absorption, DAPI fluorescence, Alexa Fluor 488 absorption and fluorescence uh, spectra. And it allows you to select different light sources, different excitation filters and different emission filters for you to see if you are able to utilize two or more of these fluorophores in a different, in a particular assay without having spectral overlap because you want to be able to interrogate one of these fluorescent molecules at a time. Otherwise, if you accidentally um, let's say, uh, 
if you accidentally excite both molecules and collect the light from both molecules, then you might get false positive results or false negative results uh, because of the fact that you're not looking at the one particular fluorophore of interest. Um, in addition to organic molecules, as I mentioned, we can also use quantum dots, quantum dots to provide optical signal, uh, fluorescent signal. We had mentioned uh, quantum dots in a previous uh, lecture, but basically just to remind you, quantum dots are very photostable. They're not going to be suffering from photo bleaching, so that, that makes them really good for biosensors. In addition, they can all be excited by one light. For example, all of these are being excited by a UV lamp and the fluorescence emission, the color of the emission, is going to be dependent on the size of the quantum dot. And as you can see, the size of these quantum dots is going to be typically smaller than the size of a protein. So they're basically molecular sized still, despite um, despite the, the, the different sizes. Uh, one thing that I had mentioned before is that these uh, quantum dots are typically made from inorganic uh, elements or compounds, and they have been known to be toxic. Uh, some of these cadmium and selenide uh, elements are not things that are normally present in our bodies, uh, and so they, have, they are known to be toxic. But for a biosensor, which is typically going to be utilized outside of the body, they are really good, good choices. Uh, the next type of optical tra transduction mechanism is luminescence, which could be either chemiluminescence or bioluminescence. Um, before I move into describing each of these two, um, I'm actually going to show here the, the, the particular um, configuration where we're going to be utilizing luminescence as a way to detect some other molecule. Just like we did with fluorescence, basically what we have is target analyte that is going to be uh, recognized by a particular antibody and that antibody is going to be further labeled with a secondary antibody that includes an enzyme that can provide us the ability to generate bioluminescence. So it's kind of an indirect measurement through the use of a label. All right, in chemiluminescence, what happens is that we're going to be utilizing a compound called luminol or a similar compound. Uh, luminol can be oxidized by peroxidase in the presence of a hydrogen peroxide to form an excited state product that emits light when it decays to the ground state. The, the, re, the re, reaction between luminol and hydrogen peroxide in the presence of horseradish peroxidase leads to the formation of aminophthalate, and in that product also you're producing light of about 430 nanometers. In bioluminescence, Typically, we're going to be utilizing uh, enzymes that are derived from various animals or, uh, or organisms. For example, firefly luciferase. Firefly luciferase interacts with deluciferin or any luciferin molecule. And in the presence of ATP and oxygen, they actually uh, produce oxyluciferin as well as light. Um, and so, as you can see in this luminescence, the main thing is that we do not need an excitation light. We're going to have a chemical reaction, and the chemical reaction is going to generate light as a byproduct. So the benefit of that is, of course, we don't need additional instrumentation, but most importantly, we're going to have no autofluorescence from the tissue being excited, or the tissue or the physiological fluid being excited by, an, uh, by, by light. So therefore, we have much better uh, signal to background level because our background is going to be very, very, very low. The only background loud light is coming from the reaction itself. And so because of that, we get better sensitivity than we would otherwise. The last set of optical transduction mechanisms uh, are going to utilize internal reflection, surface plasmon resonance, or light scattering. Uh, in the case of internal reflection, what we're talking about is utilizing optical fibers or optical waveguides, modifying them with a biorecognition molecule on their surface, 
and upon binding of the target to that biorecognition molecule, that's going to result in a change in the refractive index of that optical fiber waveguide. And so the light that is going across that optical fiber or optical waveguide is basically going to have a change uh, because of the change in the refractive index. And that's something that you can detect through a photodetector. Uh, in the case of surface plasmon resonance, we mentioned that SPR is basically looking at the oscillating electrons on the surface of a metallic substrate, such as gold here. And what happens is that the binding of the target to the, of the analyte to the bioreceptor or to the biorecognition molecule is going to change the refractive index across this um, the, the, across this uh, kind of crystal. Uh, I should mention, you know, we have gold here and that gold is being interrogated by a light source and uh, it's going, the light that is reflected is detected by a photodetector. So because of the surface plasmon resonance here, which is going to be affected by the binding of the target to the, um, photo re to the receptor or to the biorecognition molecule, we will be seeing changes in the surface plasmon resonance uh, or, or the light that is reflected here. Um, both the, the scattering light and... In terms of surface plasmon resonance, remember that we said that this is associated with the oscillating electrons at the surface of a metal, such as gold. And in this particular case, what we have is that that gold is functionalized with a biorecognition molecule in a number of different ways. Uh, that is exposed to a channel uh, through which we can flow physiological fluids of interest that, are, that might have the target analyte. When the analyte binds, that analyte is going to affect the properties of the surface, and because of that, it's going to affect the surface plasmon resonance of the gold. We can then interrogate that gold with a light source, and what we're going to see is changes in the intensity and resonance angle of the light, uh, which will be detected through a photodetector. Finally, light scattering is an another method of optical transduction. For example, what we can do is utilize gold nanoparticles that upon uh, aggregation, which could be uh, associated with uh, binding to the analyte, might actually change in their scattering properties. For example, a single gold nanoparticle might have a SPR uh, or a surface plasma resonance peak at 530 nanometers. But whenever those nanoparticles cluster into little groups, that peak is going to shift to the red toward about 650 nanometers. And that change in the peak of the wavelength can be easily detected with a photodetector. With that, I leave you with just a nice image that shows the various biorecognition elements that we can utilize, including antibodies, proteins, or even whole cells. And then the signal transduction mechanisms, which include mass detection, electrochemical detection, optical detection, or thermal detection, which is not shown here.